Good evening. Thank you for having me. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to address everyone. In the title of, of the talk, one foot on a banana peel and the other with an ulcer, I just kind of wanted to, to stress to the primary care population that, hey, this diagnosis carries a significant morbidity and mortality with it. Um, everybody here is probably probably familiar with that. Nurses see the patients that they visit that have these ulcers, that have these chronic wounds. They go down pretty quick. Um, it, it, it's a chronic disease that has its toll both psychologically and physically, and then we tell them as podiatrists, we say don't ambulate, and the deconditioning goes down from there, and then vascular comes in and tries to help the plumbing. But you know, this patient is really not taking care of themselves, and that's kind of part of what, what my, my talk addresses. So it's keeping your Hondas from breaking down. Does anyone know what the acronym Honda stands for? No? Great. You learned something today. No disclosures, other than I'm new to the area and I'm open for consultation. So Honda. So what is a Honda? It's not the automobile that I'm referring to. It's, it's an acronym for hypertensive, obese, non-compliant, diabetic, fill in the A word. I would say for the primary care physician, I was going to say antagonist because I wanted to pump them up to be the protagonist in noticing issues that can, can be extremely detrimental to the patient and that we'll talk about later. But to the vascular surgeons, they're the hypertensive, obese, non-compliant, diabetic arteriopaths. And to the VNAs, sometimes they can be the other A word that you could fill in there. So that's, these, that's what these patients are a lot of times that present to my clinic, and, and let's see how we can help them. Scroll down, please. So like I said, the, the mortality and morbidity associated with this, I, I don't know, I'm sure the podiatrists and the vascular surgeons are familiar with it, but it's 55%, 43 to 55%, five-year survival for these patients if they get a primary ulcer and they're diabetic. If they have an amputation, if they have a digital amputation, 74% mortality rate. That's, that's as high a mortality or higher of a mortality rate than prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, or Hodgkin's lymphoma. Wow. So it's a pretty, pretty significant morbidity and mortality. Keep going. And at least some of them have a good sense of humor about it. Uh, this is a patient with a BKA that got a tattoo on one side that says, one foot in the grave, pointing to his BKA leg. Kind of kind of funny, but kind of morbid all at the same time. Uh, to the vascular surgeon's delight, uh, the, the neuropathic ulcers are, are less indicative or have a, le a lower uh, mortality than the ischemic ulcers. These ischemic ulcers are associated with patients, and again, to the primary care docs, I'd say I know that your focus on microvascular disease would be to, to the heart and to the stroke risks, but this is a significant risk it's happening throughout the body. So if that toe turns black and they're stubborn and they're still smoking and they're not going to see their local vascular surgeon, then you really need to help to motivate them as best that you can to, to, to act. Keep moving. We all have to document and documentation of this, you know, is your patient neuropathic? What are their peripheral pulses? These are all adding things to an already overburdened primary care physicians. Schedule, thank you, Lee. Really love it. The target audience is awesome. Um, but you know, this is this is things that we need to be doing on these patients and, and a regular on a regular basis. <laughs> Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, what I, I've learned in, in taking care of these patients. The risk that these patients have is these bony prominences, the deformities that come with the neuropathy, the, the hammer toes, all of this sets them up. If you can't feel it and you have a bony prominence, you have a, you have a site that is prone to breakdown, that is prone to, to ulceration. And a lot of people don't know what to do with a callus that has hemorrhage underneath it. If you're treating one wound, at a patient's house and you see a callus that has black underneath it, you need to have that evaluated too because that, once it's pared down, more than likely there's an ulcer underneath it, okay? 
the, the etiology of it and how this happens is sometimes really important, I think, to express to patients. You need to let them know how did this come about. You need to let them know, Doc, I hear it all the time, I saw Dr. XYZ Thursday and he said everything was great. How did I get this wound? You, you debrided this and now I got this wound. Well, you need to be able to explain to them the issues that they have with the neuropathy. How does that, how does that create a wound underneath a callus? To any of the podiatrists, how, I'm curious, how do you, what's your canned speech for how do you explain to a patient a neuropathic ulcer and once you debrided it that the, cal that the, the wound was underneath? I, I told you I was going to call you out. Um, either of you two, how, how do you explain it to a patient? What do you, what do you break down the etiology into terms that they can understand? Well, I try to tell them that uh, the cow is formed, but they just don't feel it. Whatever goes on, they're not knowing what's going on. And any place that has a farmland and flavor so it's prone to that. The diabetic skin doesn't uh, respond to the pressure and the heat that it's getting. Shear, of course. And the skin is just getting bigger and bigger, and the nose is going to Okay. So, uh, I think you're hitting on a lot, on a lot, on a lot. Um, but, but I, I'd, I'd highly recommend what I was going to suggest to, to, you know, and it's applicable to the podiatrists and the, and the vascular surgeons is that a professional has canned speech for these common issues to be able to break it down to the patient's understanding, so that, that you say the callus thickens up to help your skin from breaking down, but that skin is thickening because of this excess pressure. And that pressure doesn't go away. So as the skin thickens and as it becomes harder, it no longer distributes that force. The tissue underneath can't handle it. The tissue dies underneath. So what I'm doing is I'm taking off this hard tissue that's passing that, that force to the, to the skin or, or to the tissue underneath. And that tissue dies. This ulcer was here. We needed to expose it. We needed to see it. You know, is my talk off perfect yet? Is my can't speech perfect? No, I think 30 years from now when I have a lot more gray hair, it'll be spot on no matter what the demographic, no matter what the background of the patient that I'm, I'm talking to is. But I think that's really important. Uh, all of these need to be debrided. Don't be scared. Take it down to, to um, find out where that blood is coming from. And can, visit, can you pair calluses? Can you debride? Okay, just checking. Scroll down. No, no problem. So on the, on the bottom right hand corner, you see the bony prominences that, that I'm talking about. These are risk areas. And if you look at what the patient's wearing on their feet and they have a foot like this, if it's not the appropriate shoe gear, you're letting that patient walk into that high risk category of primary ulcer, diabetic, five year mortality rate, not real good. Okay, so you're, you're almost lax in, in your duties of preventing this patient from having a, a bad outcome if you don't identify these risks sooner rather than later. Um, the, the ulcer on the right is a classic malperforans ulcer, classic diabetic foot ulcer at that hallux, right? Right there. And then um, the, the Photo on the right shows some signs that I wanted to just point out is really concerning, okay? When, you're not, when your neuropathic patient has significant pain, their white blood cell count may not be elevated. They may not be mounting the response that you would expect with a, with a bad, uh, thank you, with, with a bad, this one right here, with a bad infection. But this was something that came in three days ago in the ED, there, were, there was crepitus. But in addition to crepitus, there was just the pain, deep infection, hemorrhagic appearance. Really, that's a really concerning looking wound and, and that patient needs to be addressed. Um, surgically, there was emphysema in the, in, in the x-ray uh, that, that kind of you know, really guides you down that path. But the point, the take home message on, on this is if you start to see a hemorrhagic appearance, if you start to see that deep purple, if a patient who's otherwise totally neuropathic and you're packing that wound and it's fine, and then you go and you give them a squeeze on the foot and it's really painful, bells and whistles should go off, okay? Bells and whistles should go off, unless they say, I need some of that delauded, because that normally makes it feel much better. Roll down. 
the, the ischemic signs of the microvascular disease that we deal with normally come from small injury that the tissues can't heal. They can't increase the metabolic demand because of their limited perfusion, because of their, the stenosis of their, their arteries, um, and needs to be intervened on. Uh, I, I asked one of the vascular surgeons about, you know, how do you get patients enrolled in the, to, to supervise exercise activity in this whole clever trial? Um, what do you think about that? Well, she pointed out the obvious that the patients that we're having with uh, gangrenous toes and ulcers and wounds associated with their, their ischemic uh, issues, I'm not going to prescribe for them to walk in a supervised exercise activity program. So how unfortunate is that, that a supervised exercise activity that would benefit, benefit their entire overall health picture can't be prescribed because of their, their, their condition, you know, it, it's, it's really unfortunate. Scroll down. Uh, we get in the hospital, we get a lot of consults for nails and we like to tell them that we're a surgical service and we don't do nails in the hospital because otherwise we would be doing nails in the hospital all day long. However, there are times when a patient's wound is obviously and uh, created by and aggravated by nails and it's something that needs to be addressed. This is an unfortunate Alzheimer's patient um, on the right, and you can see that the large hallux nail is, is dug its way into the second, and with the neuropathy, they were not aware of it. Um, they do not know about it, but when the, the toast turns bright red and uh, somebody pays attention, um, there's an issue. And there was bone exposed at the interphalangeal joint. Um, so just, uh, again, you know, it... it it was my call to, for the primary care docs to uh, inspect the feet, to take off. You don't need to be an expert in biomechanics or the foot and ankle to see that this patient needs some, some routine care and would benefit greatly. The patient all the way down at the left, uh, I'm a big fan of taking off the shoes and looking at the inserts. How many podiatrists in here, if there's an ulcer on a hammer toe, pull out the insoles and look and see about proper fit and shoes? Nobody? Wow. Well. Maybe I'm bringing old school chiropathy back, but I pull out the insoles on every VA patient I have that has a hammer toe and ulceration at the end. And it's, it's, the reason I do it is not because I need to know it. I can see the bulge at the end of the shoe gear that shows me that that toe is extended and, and that they're, they were, the, the VA patients are great. They were told when they were 17 and going to Korea that they wear a 10 and a half and they've gotten a 10 and a half or the wife has bought them a 10 and a half ever since then and now their foot's an 11 and a half and they're still in a 10 and a half. But you, you pull the insoles out and you can show the patient and you can demonstrate to them, look, this is why. Um, and then for my more frugal or, like, I hesitate to say cheap patients, I tell them money spent on yourself is money well spent. Go get yourself a new pair of shoes that fit. Uh, or I will be dispensing them in the office for other patients in the future. Scroll down. <laughs> All right, I'll wrap it up then. The best thing that we can do is help our patients help themselves because they are non-compliant in that Honda, okay? The non-compliance really, I think, comes down to being able to persuade your patients and being able to, to spend the time and, and, and provide the care. And in, in providing care, I think you should really care about the patients and, and hope that the, what you tried to instill them with, the knowledge and the, and the understanding of their disease condition, what they can do to help themselves is truly absorbed. Because if it's not absorbed, then you may be able to get reimbursed for it, but your outcomes are going to be poor. It doesn't really make a whole lot of a difference right now other than between your peers and your colleagues, but when we go to an accountable care model, that's going to be really important. The patients who do better with less, and sometimes, you know, talk is cheap, but if it saves your patient a, bi uh, a BKA, it's going to benefit you in the future. So, this is a, a Husky, this is a Home Depot item. You can send your patients down to get. It's a mirror on a stick because a lot of patients have a difficult time examining their foot. If you, I would tell you that if you know your patient, you should know if they're a car guy or a home improvement guy. And if they're more of a car guy than they are a home improvement guy, you send them down to AutoZone and you say, they got mirrors on a stick at AutoZone too. Have them pick one up so that they can do these daily exams because chances are the primary care doctors 
aren't going to be able to do it, even though every neuropathic patient should have their shoes and socks taken off at every healthcare, um, every interaction with a healthcare provider. It's just not done. So identifying the high risk, inspecting whether it be you or whether it be motivation, motivating your patients to do the same. If they have something of concern, they should bring it to, to the team member who can best address it. If it's ischemia, get them to a vascular surgeon. If it's a, a biomechanical issue or bony prominence with, with those, those calluses that are concerning, send them to us, please, any of us. We can all help. Um, and the um, recruiting the team, play, the team is really critical. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have been trained in a limb salvage program that had a very close relationship with um, interventionalists and uh, vascular surgeons to be able to provide the flow and get these patients um, healed and, and hopefully ambulating again and, and preserving their quality of life. Thank you very much for your time.